All right, we, we are uh, revisiting Pre-Code Cinema with 1933's The Invisible Man. Let's talk about it. So this movie, um, of, the, of the Universal Monster movies I watched this year, uh, this movie was probably my favorite. Uh, and for I'll tell you why. Um, if you don't know, uh, this movie is based on the H.G. Wells novel of the same name, uh, published in 1897. Um, but what's, what, I, what I find surprising is that what is often not talked about is that it is also, well, elements of this film are taken from another novel written by Philip Wiley, and that's called The Murderer Invisible, which is where that character is, starts, is killing people. And stuff. Uh, I, I was surprised to learn that the original H.G. Wells novel didn't have that element in the book. But what you get with those two elements is a movie that is exciting and um, thrilling and fun a little bit. And, you know, and, and chilling a little bit, a little unsettling. While, while I'm curious to see what the movie would have looked like were it just solely based on H.G. Wells' work without any other elements added, I think what we have is a real gift. And it popularized um, the Invisible Man as a trope, uh, or as, you know, the kind, a kind of horror trope uh, in the ways that we know that kind of character. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, the movie was cool. Um, Played by Claude Rains, who I just learned recently. Actually, I, I watched uh, Casablanca for the first time ever recently. And um, I think after I'd seen The Mummy, or after I'd seen this movie, and I didn't realize that Claude Rains uh, plays the inspector, the character that has a, has a, uh, a friendship, shall we say, with Humphrey Bogart's character, and which, by the way, that's another review that's going to come up. I got to do the um, Casablanca because that's that needs to happen. But Claude Rains uh, was also in Casablanca, and I didn't know that. Uh, but that's cool. It was cool to to catch that. In this film, he plays Dr. Jack Griffin, who is a scientist and a mad scientist, as we come to discover, uh, who <laughs> is on a mission to devise a formula that would make him visible again. We find him at the start of the story, traveling into a, uh, a lonely small town where he's looking for a room and board, where, a place where he can continue his experiments undisturbed. Of course, this, doesn't, this uh, does not happen um, the way he wants it. And that... Um, leads to a bunch of hijinks and, well, not really hijinks, but it's, it's uh, a lot of other things ensue uh, following people disrupting his, his, his work. So, positives, things I loved about the film. Immediately, the, the introduction of, this is probably next to Dracula, it's it's the it's the most hardcore introduction of a character I've seen in these in these films here these 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 older pre-code Hollywood movies. When Doctor Griffith arrives at the tavern, it's it's something. It's serious business. It it almost feels like you know that that, that could have been made today. Again, it's another one that could have been. It's. It, I think it speaks to the timelessness of these films. It, it speaks to, um, like how they they knew what they were doing, because you could watch this movie a hundred years from now, uh, and it it feels electric and it feels as alive as as I'm sure it probably felt when it came out. And I, I loved the introduction of, of this character. The first, the first time you see him on screen. <laughs> it's, it's thrilling. It's like one of those old, it's like a Western introduction, but it's cool. It's, it's that kind of like this 
traveler, the stranger from this other place is stopping through this small town and an adventure happens uh, and then they, have to, they go to the next, the next thing. The guy comes into the tavern or the bar or the saloon or whatever you want to call it and immediately everything stops. All eyes are on this guy, this stranger. And in a lot of ways, um, The Invisible Man is almost like a, it's, a, it's you could look at it like a Western, um, except this guy is not the hero, but he wants to be. And I think that there's something there. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, so off the top, the movie starts amazingly. Claude Rains, his performance is ridiculous. So I, I didn't know this either. I learned that Claude Rains was involved in a gas attack in the, in the First World War. And that affected not only his vision, but his voice. And while I don't recommend um, getting caught up in gas attacks or anything that can distort or mess up your voice, I feel like that whatever happened to his voice did a what ended up being really uh, compelling for the role of the, the Invisible Man. His voiceover, his voice in this film is... Uh, it, it's perfect, for lack of a better term. Um, and it's it's suitably dramatic and suitably uh, bombastic and sort of, uh, uh, you know, over, over over the top in some respects. But in a lot of ways, it's not. It's It fits for what what's going on, for who this guy is. And I think when you consider the fact that whatever uh, experiment he did that messed him up, we learn it is destroying his mind as well. And when you consider that, it any level of overacting, um, overdramatic aspect is fine. Like I'm I'm completely fine with that. I got <laughs> and because this guy's going insane and it 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 works. And I think Claude Rains did a fantastic job performing the the more outlandish aspects of the character. But the other area too, which I think is, oh, it, you don't get enough of it. The other thing I think was beautiful was how he straddles, the, there's a there's a really like a, a um, one sequence, one scene, um, one f scene and like a piece of, an, of another scene that, that precedes it, which is where he has to talk to his, his, his fiance, Flora. And he becomes the most, he becomes a different person. He becomes almost um, like a kid, like a child who's, uh, you know, admiring like a pretty flower or something like that. His voice softens and his whole demeanor changes. And it's really, it's wonderful nuanced acting. Um, and you see when he greets her, it's the most beautiful thing. He says, oh, how lovely you look and how it's a, it's a complete 180 from what we got leading up to that 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 scene and so not only do you get Claude Rains and his 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 um compelling voice as the deranged you know scientist but you also get him tapping into what he was like before he went crazy you can you can get a, a glimpse of who Jack was and, based on how he deals with Flora and it's it's actually quite beautiful and the other thing that I think right before we, before they talk, there's a sequence where Flora is arriving at the house where Jack Griffith is staying with his assistant, his new person. He's going to be who's going to be assisting him on his experiments. And when he's aware that Flora and her father are coming to talk to him, it's like he forgot all about her. He's remembering who he was before that. He's remem remembering his life before the experiment went wrong. And um, it's uh, there's a real uh, uh, journey. He's like crazy scientist, and then he goes from crazy scientist to oh, I remember I I wasn't always like this. I had a life. I had a woman who I was with who I loved and and who loved me. And and that's fantastic for not seeing the guy's face. You don't see Claude's Rain's faces at all the whole movie. And to be able to so he has to do a lot of physical stuff. His acting is very physical and. You know that's how you sort of it sort of adds to what's going on. But when you don't, when you don't, when you have moments when you're not 
going on like that. How do you convey softer, quieter um, nuance without doing all this? And I think how we see it is it, it's remarkable work. I think it's great. Uh, and again, you don't get a lot of it. You probably get you get that sequence and you get probably a little bit maybe at the end. And that's and that's it. But yeah, Clarine's fantastic. Um, really, he's you know he's the star of this movie. I mean, you could say a whole bunch of other things about other actors in this film uh, and what they bring to it. Um, but uh, and they do you know everyone makes this movie what it is. I mean, without without them, you don't really have a, you don't really have a movie. But I could you can make a case. That this movie could just completely be the Claude Rain show and it would still be interesting. So think on that. Something else I appreciated was um, seeing Henry Travers. If you don't know who Henry Travers is, Henry Travers is um, um, Clarence from It's a Wonderful Life. It actually gave me, made me feel a little bit uh, warm and fuzzy to see his face in, in a movie with such uh, um, heaviness, man. It's it's a it, this this movie is it's. It's exciting. It's it's hard though too. It's rough. It's got some. It's it's violent <laughs> for the time. Um, you might imagine how surprising it was to see like such violence and such uh, such crazy stuff happening on screen. But even me right now in 2022, I was quite surprised. I was like, whoa! This is this movie is. This is like if if they had ratings back then, they didn't at, at this time. They were, I mean, they, I don't know what, how they did it. I know it was before the Hays Code, so I think if that movie were made today, it would easily be PG thirteen. <laughs> PG thirteen, like that's probably what the because <laughs> man, it's serious, man. And so, given that, it was nice to see Henry Travers because he he was you know he's the doting the father uh, scientist dude. Um, but to me, he's, he, he'll always be Clarence to me and Clarence is, is the sweetheart. And I think spiritually, I like to think that, um, the spirit of Clarence was in this film too. I mentioned the violence in this film. That's, <laughs> that's probably one of the reasons I think it's kind of cool. This film does not take, it doesn't play around. It's gradual. Like first, you know, he's just toying with people. Like having fun with people, and that's you know he's messing around, ha ha, having fun. Um, but it goes from fun to frightening fairly quickly. When the Invisible Man, the man makes the first kill, it's it's quite shocking, and it just and it just goes crazier from from there. Like I I think um, I read something recently um, where uh, I don't know if it was an article or someone's review or something where they were comparing. Universal monsters and how threatening they were, whatever it is, like Dracula, Wolfman, you know, everyone is like crazy and they, they're killing people. But of all of them, the Invisible Man probably killed the most people. Um, that just goes to show how this this guy was not a joke. And that not even just not just the fact that he killed a whole bunch of people. But that does help him earn his place among the pantheon of great villains. <laughs> and, you know, the even uh, greater place within that of Universal Monsters. That's a prestigious, you know, role. It's a prestigious position to, to, to have. Being one of the Universal Monsters, there aren't that many of them, you know, to, so to be included in that group, it, that's a, that, that's, that feels major to me. Uh, and certainly the fact that the Invisible Man has killed so many people that <laughs> that that um, I think that helps. Uh, but yeah, no, the movie goes fairly. It's fairly strong uh, with the and the other thing. Uh, speaking of that, with the amount of violence or whatever and death at all, whatever in the movie, how the film um, goes about depicting that. Uh, there is a train sequence that's expertly, you know, obviously they're using miniatures, but it's well executed. For the time, again, it's amazing how they're able to do these things 
with such limited resources, right? And we talk about effects. The, the, the special effect of this film is making Jack Griffith invisible. How the heck? I mean, we know logically how they did it. They used mirrors and they used different things how they did it. But it's just mind-boggling how they were able to, to do that. And it's effective. Like you're sufficiently, and not even that, they made him invisible. The other thing is that when they made him interact with surfaces, the nuances of it, for instance, you might see a chair, like a puffy chair. And when characters see him sit down, you see the chair go in, like the seat goes in, you know someone's sitting in the chair. It's ridiculous. It's like, oh, and you get scared going, oh, like, because you can't see him. But you know, he's, you saw the chair dip in. You know, somebody's butt is in the chair. That's unsettling. <laughs> right? right? Or they show him, you know, how he's interacting with like a, a broomstick or uh, getting into a car. And what I love, it, my favorite thing about how these special effects worked, the car sequence, uh, getting into a car specifically was one of my favorite um, examples of this. There's a sequence where, there's a scene where he's, they're going to go back to the, the tavern to retrieve his work, like his binder and all of his notebooks, all of his notes. And they get in the car. Jack is getting to the car. The door opens and it closes, but he closes it again. It's like that nuance of like, you know, when you shut the car door and maybe you don't close it all the way, you open it again and you close it. It's like that. How did they do that with no one there? There's no, the, the, no one is there to do it. <laughs> like, you don't see that. You don't see a body doing that. But the fact that they, that they, um, we're able to to show it and to pick that that little that helps sell the 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 reality that this man is invisible and that he's actually a, a presence that is there and it's it's very effective um so yeah top notch special effects um right now that would be all mostly computer generated right now and i think that's what what makes it better i think than what you might see today is that it's not computer generated <laughs> It's practical. They had whatever they used, whatever they had to to make that work. And and also, so it's the practical effect of it, but also Claude Rains, his physical movements, like he's laughing. Ha, ha, ha. Like, obviously, no one laughs like, ha, 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 right? But <laughs> but there are moments when he had to do that. But that sells the the um, it sells the, the illusion. It's real. Like, you don't question it. Dude's invisible. Um, yeah, special effects are amazing in this movie. Oh, uh, the plot is also pretty serious too. So like narratively, so you got these guys uh, and it plays out like how you would expect it to play. At first, when people start hearing whispers of an invisible man or whatever it is, you don't believe it. And it plays, that's how it would be. People, most, most people would be skeptical at first. And when people start getting hurt, is when you begin to start suspecting, oh, there might be something to this. Uh, what's cool is when the police get involved. These people are real, they're trying all the different tricks to try to catch this dude. And it's not, <laughs> it's not working. They're coming up with all these plans. We're going to use ga uh, uh, oil or something. We're going we're gonna to use a net so we can see him. We're going to trap him in the snow. They, they're, they're legitimately coming up with, with plans that are well, you know, for the most part, well thought out. Um, Given the logic, you know, the logic behind it is it is there. They just can't catch this dude. Like, they, you know, and I think that's what makes him much more, that's what makes him, uh, the, the Invisible Man, so scary. <laughs> the, the authorities can't even, they, they, they're trying everything to do to, to stop him, and, and they can't. And I think the way he's able to, to finagle his way into different situations without them knowing and he's able to get the inside scoop on whatever the plans are. That's it's an, he's he's uh, uh, he's probably one of the most threatening villains. No disrespect to Dracula, we talked about him already. We know how serious he is, or Wolfman, or anybody else. But when you have someone who is like the Invisible Man, you got not only is he he's supremely intelligent and cunning. Um, but he's also super strong. It feels like the, the, this is not explicitly stated in the movie, but my guess is 
is that the serum or whatever he the formula also gave him super strength because he's jacking people up with ease and doing all these different things, carrying people and things with, with, with ease. And, and so you have someone who's supremely intelligent, uh, deranged a little bit, super strong, uh, and can get in and out of situations without being noticed. That's, that's a hard thing to, to, to stop. Without infrared, you have no heat seeking anything to, to see him. You you know they had to. It was like very like basic back to the basics type of situation. No tools, no gadgets. They had to stop him with just using the surroundings. Luckily, it was snowing. Lucky the weather uh, worked for them because they he wouldn't have made it out. Like the or they wouldn't have made it. Something else I thought was interesting that I really appreciated about this film is that a lot of these Universal monsters. Mostly, almost all of them have a, I think with the exception of Dracula, um, there is a tragic thread about their characters. So Jack Griffin is a man who, like Henry Frankenstein, wanted to do more. Like he started out with, I want I wanted to have my name listed among the greatest scientists of the world. I want to create something that's going to be like for real, like it's gonna cement my legacy. It's going to, you know, I, it's gonna make me rich, whatever, right? Again, common, you know, human flaw, um, hubris, right? This vanity. I'm intelligent enough to make something that is great and my name's gonna be attached to that. He goes too far and makes himself permanently invisible. The tragic piece is he doesn't want to stay that way. He actually wants to to make himself visible again and get back to his old life. Um, unfortunately, the experiment is messing up his mind, so he can't think straight. He can't think clearly. He's now deranged, and that's that's kind of, that's sad when you think about the potential he could he could have used his mind and talents or something else. And I think were he to have been able to make himself visible again and somehow get back to normal and, you know, look back on his experience as an invisible man as like a bad memory. That's the sort of dream. You go, oh, if only he had he had realized his error sooner. Um, it's too late. Too late for him. So that part that kind of sucks is that 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 tragic element actually makes you you and so you care about him because of that. I think um, if he was just you know killing everybody for without any you know without that piece, you would care less about him. Uh, so there's that piece I really appreciated. And the other thing I think is cool, as an aside, um, the way the film starts is already invisible, and he's on the, his quest is to find you know he's going to try to be. Uh, his goal is to be visible again. That's the, the goal. He just gets sidetracked. Now, another movie would start that, like Hollow Man, for instance, or another Invisible Man type of movie, where he would be regular, you would see him go through these experiments and become invisible, go on a killing spree, and then get jacked up at the end of the situation, right? Um, but I, I, I appreciate that this movie doesn't start like that. And this goes back to what I talked about earlier and I think a couple other earlier reviews of these pre-code movies, which is where they just get right to the story. They don't, there's none of that fluff setting you up for the inciting incident. We know what the inciting incident is because it's, it's told to us, but the movie doesn't start with that. He's already invisible. He's already on the quest. He's, he's tunnel vision about getting his, his experiments right so he can be, be visible again. That's the... The goal, and I think there's cool. It's cool to have it start that way because, again, movies today don't always do that. And the last thing I'll say about this movie is the way it ends. It's actually it's so there's a poetry to how it ends because his goal was to continue to do experiments, and he made himself invisible. He was going to do what he could to make himself visible again, and the irony is. He succeeded in doing that. It just he just didn't do it in the way that he wanted to. 
the way it's depicted, again, it's amazing for the time. They would have done all kinds of stuff, CGI, whatever it is to make it. How, I, I don't know how they, how they made him appear with like his the skull and the muscle tendons and different things before he was fully visible. But it was very well done. There's one other thing I want to mention about when I, I mentioned Flora. I'm going to talk about uh, the women of these movies. The only downside, I think, really to this film is the portrayal of Flora. Now, obviously, that's a, that is a, is a, um, a sign of the time when the movie was made and, you know, just in general how certain women were portrayed in films like this. So I recognize that. It's a product of, of the time. Um, but if anything was annoying to me at all during the, <laughs> my viewing was how she was portrayed or how she went about doing stuff. She was just, she was overly dramatic about, well, this is, she felt overly dramatic to me and she didn't really contribute too much to the story other than being a, like another, uh, like a, a piece for Jack to try to return to. Like it's a, a secondary thing. She felt like a tool, like a, a prop. And the way, she's only in the film sporadically, you know. You, you could have not had her in the movie and it would have made no difference, I don't think. Um, in fact, you could have had her referenced in the film. You could probably never see her and it would be, it would be fine. Um, I understand why they added her. She, she wasn't a part of the original uh, story, my understanding. She's not in the book, I don't think. But um, that was probably the the only sore spot on the film uh, for on the film for me was Flora. Aside from that, if you haven't watched this movie in a while, I would recommend watching it again, just to you know see if you see how you like it. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was. Again, it was my favorite of the Universal Monster movies to date that I've seen. Uh, I haven't seen them all. I think I'm missing Wolfman and then The Creature from the Black Lagoon. But um, this one's clearly my, definitely my favorite. So, um, and while we're there, I have to mention uh, The Invisible Man from a couple years ago, just while we're talking about it. That is a unique, I'm gonna, I have to review that one too. I, I loved that movie. I thought it was very well done. Um, it definitely takes the idea of the Invisible Man and flips it in a way that was pretty compelling. So more on that in another review. But for now, this one's done. Thank you for watching. Come back. we got more reviews on the way. So in the meantime, I'll catch you guys later.